Welcome to Future Proof, where I, Michael Swaim, nerd out about classic sci-fi staples and their real-world counterparts. But before we do that, I thought I'd take a moment to shout out some of your comments, now that the show's been running for a minute. For example, at DraveDen9745 says, pay this man four times whatever you think he's worth. Wow! A hundred bucks an episode? That'd be awesome. Thanks, Draveden, and everyone for such a warm welcome back. At Ideas of the Shipwrecked says, After hours, but it's just Michael moving from seat to seat, carrying on a conversation in the voices of the other three while gently weeping. <laughs> that's not a suggestion, that's just a description of what you see if you come over to my house. At Peter Allen 7085 says, Bring more After Dark people back. We miss them all. Oh yeah, I love doing After Dark. It was just so great getting to work with Katie Stoll, Soren Jackknife, and Draniel O'Branion. Saltberry15 said, superhero origins could be a cool topic. I agree, that could be cool. It's just a little broad to cover in eight minutes, so I don't think that one connects, but there's plenty more where that came from. At DJ Syntix says, I would love to see you talk about cloning. Nah, that's dumb, we're not gonna do that. Just don't want to, but please do keep those suggestions coming. Like at David Williams HT2CU did when he said, I don't care what future tech stuff you talk about, Michael. Well, that's not helpful at all, is it? I need some direction here, people. You don't go to an improv show and yell out all of the above. Let's get our shit together. All right, at Jeffrey Strain 2651 says, drop some weight. All right, we're done. We're done with that. In fact, I wish I had a time machine so I could go so far into the future that everyone forgot this happened. Oh, hey, there's a topic, forgetting. No, time machines! That's even better! After all, time machines have pervaded pop culture since H.G. Wells dropped the aptly named The Time Machine in 1895. Even before then, Wells had been messing with the idea in short stories like The Chronic Argonauts as early as 1888. And even before then, Spanish sci-fi muchacho Enrique Gaspar published the novel El Anacronopete, or That Which Flies Against Time often translated and retitled as The Time Ship, When Time Flies, or Push by Sapphire, which is admittedly pretty confusing. In that story, time is a property of our exposure to the atmosphere, which the author intuited based on the fact that food sealed in cans stays fresh. I don't know if that's true about how time works, but our team is looking into it. But believe it or not, even before then, writer and journalist Edward Page Mitchell released a short story called The Clock That Went Backward, in which the eponymous timepiece sends some 1800s people back to 1574 so they can take part in the Siege of Leiden. And if anyone watching knows what that is, hey, good for you. I'm sure many good people died at it, or got married at it, or whatever it was. Truthfully, the idea of traveling through time has probably always been with us, since our sense of time is one of the cardinal things that makes our species and our way of perceiving the universe unique. Call your dog over right now, and chances are they'll come. Tell your dog to meet you here at the same time tomorrow, and you're gonna have a tougher time. The fact that we can even conceptualize tomorrow and yesterday is fascinating in itself, and time travel is a natural extension of that idea. After all, we can change direction in space, why not clockwise? And perhaps it's the unique and nigh incomprehensible nature of time that has led to so many different time travel systems throughout our storytelling history. There's the Back to the Future version, where one timeline is sacrosanct, and mucking around with it can have dire consequences, like stopping your mom from getting assaulted. With some minor tweaks, this is the system employed by a wide range of sci-fi properties, from the Terminator to Time Cop to the TARDIS. In every case, these concepts owe something to that first novel, which originated the idea of a big machine you get into that projects you to a predetermined point in space-time. I say space-time and not just time, since any time machine also has to account for the movement of astronomical objects, like the rotation of the Earth. That means even if you feel like you're landing in the exact same spot, your time machine had to move you many miles through space to make that happen. We usually ignore this because watching Marty McFly suffocate in space is not a fun four-quadrant romp. In some cases, getting back home to your own time is as easy as getting back in the machine. In other cases, it's a one-way trip to a thumbs up at the lava factory. This setup is so common because it speaks directly to one of the most fundamental human urges, 
the ability to control outcomes. Another one of the defining traits of life on Earth is that at various levels of sophistication, most animals succeed by identifying patterns of cause and effect and using them to predict what might happen to or around them next. In a brain as complex as a human's, that naturally leads to the question, what if I could go back and redo the cause? Could I control the effect? Most movies answer no because life is too complex for that. See Back to the Future, The Butterfly Effect, or Primer, a time travel movie where the one sacrosanct timeline gets so twisted into Jeremy Baramy bullshit that I still have no idea what actually happened. The single, shared timeline view of time underlies the majority of our time travel stories, probably because constraining the patterns in play allows for cool paradoxes and twisty thought experiments like the too-good-to-spoil reveal at the end of Predestination, or the classic causal loop paradox featured in 12 Monkeys and the short that inspired it, Chris Marker's La Jete. The other dominant view of how time travel might function involves every decision ever made splitting the timeline into a million billion trillion different universes like string cheese, which can be hard to depict on screen. Maybe the closest we've ever gotten was Interstellar, which used fractalized buildings to abstractly represent the concept. So if time travel is, by its very nature, a shared delusion, probably housed within our consciousnesses and nowhere else, and potentially impossible or even inconceivable to the human brain, can we ever hope to construct a time machine in real life? The answer to that is pretty incredible. No. No, probably not. Very unlikely. But we can at least try to understand time a little better and how it relates to both space and movement. Because, baby, from the vantage of special relativity, we're all Guy Pierce. Just a flock of little Guy Pierces, the nexus of both time travel and forgetting. You don't have to be an Einstein to understand special relativity, but it helps. The theory casts a long shadow and has many, many implications. But today, we're interested in two particularly mind-blowing aspects of how it applies to our perception of time. The first is, we're always time traveling. And I don't mean just traveling forward at a rate of one day per day. I mean that there is no your time or my time or even a background constant that is the proper time. There's no ruler. The reason it's called relativity is that Albert realized that everything in the universe can only be understood by its relationship to something else. Everything's relative. If you were nothing but pure consciousness and encountered only one thing, having no previous knowledge of anything else, it would be impossible to define that thing's characteristics. It's literally all there is. As far as you're concerned, that Bart Simpson doll is the universe. And the quality we call color is just the one color the doll is, yellow. He's naked in this example. It's only when you introduce a second thing that you can say, oh, Bart's hair is different than Homer's. Let's invent the word pointy to describe one and round to describe the other. Everything is comparative. This applies to time, too. The time you're experiencing is like, just your opinion, man. Einstein showed that space and time are connected, fundamentally, in the sense that the sum of both as pertains to an object is always the same. They're inversely proportional, too. I'll explain. If you start moving through space a lot, you move through time a little less to balance it out. That's just the way the universe works. Don't look at me. I know, it's fucked up. But it's also why moving rapidly through space, like flying in a spaceship, would cause you to age more slowly relative to someone whose position in space-time remains relatively constant. The cool thing is this actually happens at any speed. You're bending time every time you walk to the kitchen to get more Mr. Beast bars and whippets. That's right, I know my audience. The effect is also exaggerated the more space you cram between the two observers. One way to conceptualize this is to imagine two people not moving relative to one another a billion miles apart with a line drawn between them. That represents their feeling of existing now and the fact that their perceptions are currently the same. But if one of those people starts rocketing or even cross-country skiing away from the other, that slows their relative passage of time slightly. They experience one now after another smoothly flowing forward no matter what, because we all do. But their watch would now disagree with the observer we consider stationary. And what's really crazy is, because the effect is exaggerated over distance, even that tiny change can mean one person's perception of what's happening now can be centuries different than another's if they exist far enough away. And even weirder, if the observer we've allowed to move starts to ski in the opposite direction, their perception of time swings the other way, 
toward the stationary observer's future. Just like all of space in the universe exists somewhere out there, all of time does too. There is no concrete now. And in fact, the past, present, and future are all equally accessible under different circumstances and from different vantages, all at once. When will then be now? Soon. Which, incidentally, is the theory of time put forward by the Tralfamadorians, an alien race from Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. And in his first book, Sirens of Titan, he also describes a chronosynclastic infundibulum, a place in the universe where two people can disagree about time and both be right. Was Vonnegut Einstein traveling forward from the very near past? No, probably not. Very unlikely. Hey, drop me a like and a comment letting me know what sci-fi trope you'd like me to cover next. I'll totally do it, I swear.